Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live at Calvary Church in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media or to tune into our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Now here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Amen. Would you take your Bibles and open them to Acts chapter 9? Acts chapter 9, when you get there, we're going to pick up in verse 31, where we left off last time. I've entitled our Bible study, I Want to Be Used of God. But after reworking it, I think we could have another title, 10 Things That Will Help You Serve God Well, or compared to what we taught last time, 10 More Things That Will Help You Serve God Well. I put some format to this after teaching it last night, because in chapter 9, remember, Saul of Tarsus becomes Paul the Apostle. And it's a beautiful thing to watch God transform lives. Generational change comes through salvation. And you know, Saul had plans. He had plans heading to Damascus to destroy the believers there. He was zealous to protect Judaism. And he was headed to Damascus. I believe he thought he could do it single-handedly. Even though he did have an entourage, he had those with him. He's headed to Damascus and, you know, Saul had plans, but listen, God had plans and he flipped it around. Saul had a purpose, but God had a purpose. Saul, he had power and authority that we had the letters to to do whatever he wanted. But you know, God had a power and he overruled Saul and brought him to himself. And Saul's a changed man now. By the time we get to verse 31 of chapter 9, he's born again. A lot of time has passed as we learned last time, but he's living out this newness of life, knowing this truth. And listen, this is so important. If this is all you leave with today, this is what you must remember. Remember this, it is God's work in you and through you for his good pleasure. It is not your own human effort or all the intelligence you might have, or all the degrees you might have earned, or all the expertise you have, or all the natural talents, the spiritual gifts. What matters in your life is that it's God working in you, working out his plan, and working out his purposes, and providing to you his power and his provision. It's a frustrating thing. It's a frustrating thing to push your plans onto God and then say they're from God. You know, when I hear the word frustrations, I hear the words disappointment, it always reminds me that somebody's dealing with unmet expectations. You know, when you're disappointed, it means you expected something and it didn't happen. And so now you're disappointed about it. Or even disappointment can lead to frustrations where, you know, I'm just frustrated where, where I'm at right now. I'm just frustrated with what's going on. I'm frustrated with my church. I'm frustrated with my wife, my, whatever it might be, because there are expectations that you have or you've placed that haven't been met. But listen, when you're walking in the spirit, allowing God to lead your life, there's far less disappointment and frustration because you just know that God is sovereign. You know that he's going to use these things. You know that everyone's going through something and listen, I know this is hard to hear, but you got to hear it. It's not, you're not the only one suffering today. There's a lot of pain in this room, a lot of difficulty. And if we're not careful, we'll just get our eyes all on ourselves and become very unuseful for the kingdom. When you try to make things happen, you take things into your own hands, you get impatient This happens a lot when you're waiting for something or you're in a season where something's up ahead and it hasn't happened yet. And and because it hasn't happened, you can get very impatient. But we've learned throughout the scriptures that impatience can lead a person to big mistakes. I think of Abraham and Sarai. You know, they just couldn't wait for the promise, even though I know they believed in the promise of God. And they did something very natural, very normal, but it wasn't from God and created a little Ishmael. And you know, I find that there's many people in the church today that have a lot of Ishmael's running around because you refuse to wait on the Lord and trust him. And that's where Saul is. Saul's in a place where he's in a relative season of silence because now our attention is going to go back to Peter for a while. 
But you have to remember that even in the silence, God is at work. He's doing something different. It doesn't have to always be demonstrative. You don't always have to understand it. Not everything needs to be explained to you. We walk by faith and not by sight. We walk by faith and not explanations. I know some of you are waiting right now. What's the future and what's, the, what's gonna happen? I, I don't know. I don't know. But I do know this. God is gonna get you there. He has an intended purpose for your life and mine. And he's gonna get you there. You're going to make it. You know that trying to help God out is is very difficult in our lives. You know, they did a survey not too long ago where they were asking for some popular phrases and whether they thought it was in the Bible or not. 25% of the people polled, these are people that said they know the Bible, people that said they read the Bible, people that said they were Christians or in church all the time. 25% of them said they believed that the phrase, God helps those who help themselves, was in the Bible. It's not. So if you ever take the survey, just know now you were taught well. It's not in the Bible. The exact opposite is taught in the Bible, actually. That God, he tends to help the helpless and the weak and the needy. What our part is, is just to trust and obey, knowing that God is in our lives. I like what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9 and verse 13. He said, he said, Go and learn this. Like you're looking for things to learn. Here's something. Jesus said, go learn this. Go learn this. You ready? Learn what this means, he says. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. Because I didn't come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. He says, learn this. I think part of learning it is that we are those sinners that God called. We can't forget where we came from. The great grace and mercy in our life. For some of us, we were delivered from a deep pit, from a series of bad decisions where we almost ruined our lives. You know, remember where we came from. But for some of you, you were gifted with the heritage of growing up in a godly home. Don't you forget that. That's the grace of God in your life. We got to learn things the hard way. You got to avoid things because you listen and you were listen to your parents and you grew up in a home that honored God. Or maybe your grandmother or your grandfather, like Timothy, had such a beautiful heritage in the scriptures. Let's not forget where we came from. Pick up now with all that in mind in verse 31, it says, then the churches throughout all Judea, Galilee and Samaria had peace and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Spirit, they were multiplied. You can see back in verse 30, Saul is taken off now. He first went to Caesarea, then they sent him off to Tarsus. And now with him away, I want you to notice the churches are being built up and strengthened. It wasn't too long ago that the churches were fearful and concerned because Saul of Tarsus were coming, but now the churches are encouraged and built up. So if you're taking notes, I want to show you a few things within these, this text And through our Bible study today, 10 things that will really help us. If we want to serve God well, then take these things into consideration and learn them as unto the Lord. So number one, I want you to notice from the verse 31, that it's important that you give out as much as you take in. You give out as much as you take in. Here the church in verse 31 is in a place of peace and prosperity. They're in a good season. They're multiplying. Don't miss this. They're multiplying. We haven't really read of that since earlier in the book of Acts. So there's been great difficulty, but now there's multiplication. God has saved Saul. He's got plans for him. We'll get to that in the rest of the book of Acts over time. But learn to give out as much as you take in. It's been said that if the church is to be evangelistic, she must be then spiritual. But if the church is to be spiritual, then she must be evangelistic. And so right now, you know, you can look at the church like it's a, two, it's a two-sided coin. You're, you're in one side of the coin right now. On one side of the coin, the gathering of the church together is so that you might be edified. You might be built up. That's what the word means. That, that you might be equipped for the work of the ministry. That you would be strengthened. You almost get the picture, too, of being edified, like you'd be fortified. You'll be established. And that's really why we gather on the first day of the week. Like we need it. We're going to head into a week. If God would give that to us, we need to be strengthened. We need to be reminded he's on the throne. We need to be reminded that God is with us, that we, we need to sing. There may be this week you won't even be able to sing 
It'll be so hard or so challenging, but you sing today. And so God dropped those lyrics into your heart for use at a later time. We're being built up. That's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin happens when you leave. The other side of the coin is this, that not only are we to be constantly feeding on the word of God, but we're also then to be constantly living the word of God. Like that, that's life. Like, like you're not taking in to not give out. It's not just bless me, Lord, bless me, Lord, bless me, Lord, bless me, Lord. But it's this, bless me, I'm blessing others. Blessing others, Lord, fill me. Blessing others, fill me. Be ye filled with the Holy Spirit, the Bible says. Not to be drunk with wine, which is in excess. We need to be living sober-minded lives as we are blessing others. It's very important that you give out as much as you take in. And as you and I feed on the word of God, you'll see the church benefits the church is multiplied. The Holy Spirit comforts, and you're able then to be fruitful. Notice now in verse 32, we turn our attention to Peter now. Now it came to pass, as Peter went through all the parts of the country, that he also came down to the saints who dwelt in Lydda. There he found a certain man named Aeneas, who had been bedridden eight years and was paralyzed. And Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus the Christ heals you. Arise and make your bed. And he arose immediately. So all who dwelt in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. Now we're reading the Bible today and we're reading this and we, don't, we may not recognize this is astonishing. <laughs> this is amazing. Now this guy, he wasn't always bedridden and he wasn't always paralyzed. But for eight years... He's stuck. Can you imagine the stories he has to share? Can you imagine what's going to come out of his life as Peter shows up here? The scene shifts from the conversion of Saul, the fruitfulness of the church, the ministry of Peter. And I want you to notice here, which brings us to number two, but I want you to notice Peter's moving. He's moving. He's not waiting around, but he's going through all parts of the country. He's moving. So let me give you number two. Number two, you want to you wanna really improve your service? You want to be used to the Lord? Here's number two. Look for things to do. Look for things to do in the Lord. Look for things to do. That's what he's saying. Look at the word here. It says in verse 33, he found. Now the word here in the original language can mean two different things. It can mean you stumble upon, like you just come upon them and you kind of found, you found yourself there. Or, which I think it means here, the definition can mean you searched it out. Peter's going about living life through all the country, being the man who God called him, and he's looking for something to do. He's looking for someone to help. He's looking for someone to care for. Now, we don't know if he was praying, uh, send me to a sick person, send me to a discouraged person. We don't know that. But this is the man that God said, you want something to do? Here, this guy needs you. And he shows up. I, I would say if Number two is look for something to do. Number two, A would be look for something to do and do it. You don't need to wait for a church ministry or an announcement. If God has placed something on your heart, go do it. You know, it, this happens all the time. Maybe you realize it, recognize it or not, but somebody comes to you with a great need. They're in your neighborhood. You work with them. They come tell you their story and you, and you pray for them and you love them, but then you tell them, well, call the church. Well, let me disciple you on that. Don't tell them to call the church. You want to know why? The church is already there. You're right there. Take care of that need. Minister to that person. You see, God brought the church to them. But if you're not looking for something to do, then you'll have nothing to do. And it's amazing. You can, you can see this. You see this at work. You see this in the church. If you, want, if you need something done, you need something to get done, you look for somebody that's busy and you give it to them. And they'll get it done. That's why some of you on tomorrow morning when you show up to work, you're going to have an extra stack of papers on your desk. And they belong to the coworker in the desk next to you. And you know what's going to happen. You're going to get maybe a little bit out of shape. I can't believe this. I don't know nobody does their job. And I was, no, no, no. I want you to give you, I want to give you another way of looking at it. There's a stack of work on your desk because you're known as someone that gets things done. And, just as a side note, it's your job. So do it without murmuring and complaining. You go, oh, thanks, Ed. Yeah, I mean it. Here, here let me re redefine your job for you. Ready? 
You get get paid to do what you're told. One amen. (laughs) You get paid to do what you're told. So do the work because that's an affirmation of your faithfulness. And there might be offs of politics and stuff in there. But why get involved in all that? You're a messenger and ambassador of Jesus. Just do what God's called you to do and be a good witness. Do what you need to do. Like look for things to do and do them. And, and take that a perspective in the spiritual realm. Peter, he is going around, ministering, serving. We don't know everything that he's doing, but he comes to the saints and he found a man and he served him. He served him. Peter's moving. You know, it's one of the reasons why we place a strong emphasis here at Calvary on short-term mission trips, why we try to have a lot of them. Now, of course, a short-term mission trip supporting the missionaries that we have and sent out. Uh, the, the main reason is to support them and to encourage them. Send a team there, take resources, help them finish a project, do something for them, give them a break. Like we really want the missionaries to be refreshed and strengthened, that they feel better after we leave than when before we got there. Not because we left, but after we leave, you know, because it's hard to host a team. It's not an easy thing for a missionaries to host teams and it's a lot of work, but we want them to be refreshed. We want them to be encouraged. That's the primary reason. But another reason why we have short-term teams is to put you in a position where you are on the move yourself, where where you're stepping into the story of God that's already ongoing. You know, the mission trip we we announced last week to Uganda, you know, it's going to happen whether you want to go or not. They're going to go. Somebody's going to Uganda. Even if it's the only the person that's leading it, somebody's going to Uganda. But most likely a full team will be going. So you kind of let that come and go, whether you're a part of it or not. God is working in Uganda. And so the thing is, is do you want to be a part of it? Should you be a part of it? And maybe you're the next missionary. It's like, how would I even know? How would I even know if I'm the next missionary? We'll take a short-term trip. I mean, on top of all that, some of you just need to get out of the United States of America and see the world for what it is. And see the opportunities for what they are to be reminded that God loves every tribe, tongue, and nation. Heaven's going to be filled with the people that cover the globe and get to see it. But let me give you a third point. It's kind of a a sub-point to this that came up last night as I was teaching this, and I want to share it with you. And here's number three. Number three is do things you don't want to do. You want to be used greatly of God, you want to grow, then do things you don't want to do. Which brings me to me. I personally have never really liked traveling. Uh, I still really don't like traveling, even though God has me doing it a lot. And I especially didn't want to go on any missionary trips at all. I know my calling. You know what my calling is? Sending you on missionary trips. And I'm perfectly content with that. I've always been okay with that. Like, it's hard for me, hotels, planes, I always come back sick, jet lag, all of it. Food, food, food. It's so hard for me. I'm a very simple man with a very simple palate, so all these different foods, and it just gets me sick, and it's just, it's challenging. But back then, in the early days of this church, God sent a man by the name of Bill into my life. It was a cold call. We get a lot of cold calls for missionaries. Typically, I don't take them, but I happen to answer the phone that day, and he's a friend of the friend, so I made an appointment with them, and Bill got into my life, and he says, Ed, you got to go with me. You got to go with me on this trip, and I'm like, nah, bro, I'm a a mobilizer. I'm a trainer. I don't send. I'll send Pastor Dave. I'll send JJ. I'll send guys, but he says, no, Ed, you need to go. It's important that you go, and I'm like, nah, bro, seriously, I'm not going, and that was all the constant pressure, but then the Lord was thinking, just really speaking to me, hey, so Ed, you don't want to go? Yeah, I don't want to go. Oh, okay. I, can't, I don't know how God talks to you, but you know, sometimes how God talks to me. It's like, oh, all right. And so you know, through Bill, like through Bill, um, I finally just like, okay, I got to do it. I got to do things that I don't want to do. And it ended up being uh, opening a door for me of just learning that that's a big part of my life. I have to do regularly things I don't want to do for the kingdom, for the glory, even small things, you know, it helps in marriages, helps with kids. Like, like, you, like if you learn how to do the things you don't want to do, you can just that, you'll just dismiss a lot of complaining, a lot of murmuring, you just go for it and God will teach you. He has something on the other side for you. 
But since you're always on this side, you never experience that kind of spiritual growth that can only come by doing something you don't want to do. I mean, I think of all kinds of things I learned. The ministry was to Cairo, Egypt. It was to the poorest of the poor in Cairo, a little small group of Christians in this 99.9% Islamic country that said, you know, it's probably a little less than 99% because there are some Christians there, but they said that they're open, but they're really not. And we were taking things in and we were ministering and supporting Pastor Hisham. And, and I remember this, this time, I remember, I would have never experienced this had I not gone. Had I not gone, I would have never learned this, this little tidbit that I didn't even know I needed to learn. So Pastor Hisham, he lives among, uh, he's since gone home to be with the Lord. I think I shared that, but he was living among the people he served. He didn't have to, but he lived in the, what we would consider the projects today. He lived there with them and didn't have much. And so part of our ministry was taking resources to him, helping him, taking extra money to him and, and ministering to him. And then when we go, part of the ministry is we're going to take care of the pastor. Like, well, what do you want? What's the restaurant you want to go to that you can't go? We want to take your family. How can we bless you and encourage you? And we finally talked him into it because he was that kind of guy. Talked him into it. He finally said, let's go to this restaurant. So we're walking in. You know, he would kick the pigeons out of the way and we walk in and we stand in there. And so order whatever you want. Doesn't, don't even worry. Yeah, but this car, don't, don't even worry about it. We will take care of it. So he ordered his favorite dish, and they delivered it to him right there at the table. It was pigeon. Yeah, he ordered pigeon. That's what he wanted. And they delivered it to him on the table. It was all brown with the beak and the eyes and the feet. That's how they delivered it to him. And that's what he wanted. I don't want... I wasn't intending to make this funny, but I guess it is. I, I don't want pigeon. All right? That's not my choice. But here's the thing. Here's the point. Here's the point. We're, we know how we feel. We hear that. And we're like, that's not my preference. That's not what I order. Why would he do that? Maybe it's the pigeon we kicked when we walked in and all that, right? But I want to give you a different angle that the Lord spoke to me about. Me. Because, you know, when you travel and you're taking mission trips or you're in someone's house, the respectful, honorable thing to do is to eat what you're served. And in Egypt, they just keep filling it, filling it. If you eat what you serve, that's respectable. You, you just do it without a word and say, thank you for all the hospitality and care that you have taken care of us from the U.S. But when it came to Hisham there and watching him enjoy his meal, I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, who are you to judge what a man eats or not? What do you care what do you care? So you have a different preference, but what do you care? Or even deeper as God does deep stuff with me, like what, what, what's your problem, man? Who do you think you are? That's what he wanted. And believe me, I had these feelings like, oh well, man, I mean, I had them and they're still there. You know, the Bible calls that the old man. The Bible calls that the flesh. But you see, if you, never take, if you never do things you don't want to do, then you're limiting the ability of the Holy Spirit to reveal to you things you don't even know. You would have thought, we're going and we're going to bless this pastor. And we did. But then the Lord's going, Ed, I'm going to bless you too. I'm going to teach you a lesson you can't read in a book. I'm going to teach you a lesson you can't listen to on an MP3 or on an app. YouTube's not going to give this one to you, Ed. You've got to be there. And it's on the other side of doing something you don't want to do. Well, come back with me as Peter is used in this man's life. He's flowing in the gifts of the Spirit. I mean, the Spirit of God is moving heavy in Peter's life here. You've got the gift of manifestation, 1 Corinthians 12, the gift of knowledge. You have the gift of faith here. You have the gift of wisdom. I mean, it's a pretty bold thing. Jesus says, you're healed. And that's exactly what happened. He was com completely and instantaneously healed, which brings us to number four. Number four on the list here is it's important that you depend upon and follow the Holy Spirit, that your life is spirit-led, not just in word or some cliche or bumper sticker, like if God gives you a word, share it. You don't need to know how he's going to use it. You don't need to know what the end result is. Like if Jesus implores you, hey, Jesus Christ wants to heal you, then just do it. By faith. And let me just say this. I believe and will teach you 
until I go home to be with the Lord. I believe of a word spoken in faith. And I believe in a word of faith. And I believe a word in faith and in due season, which would cause some of you to pause. It's like, what? I've heard that before, Ed. I've heard that before. You believe in the word of faith? Yes. You believe that uh, to speak words in faith? Yes. And here's the problem. That phrase has been corrupted by many today. So what you think it is, is probably not what I'm teaching you it is from the Bible. It is not, and I just have a one word the way it's portrayed in the world, uh, you know, televangelists and all that stuff. I just have one word. I'll just get it out now. What you see on TV and the false teachings of the word faith movement is nonsense. That's all it is. It's unbiblical nonsense. The idea that your words can create reality and you can, you know, the way the world describes that, the law of attraction and you can just command God around. Can I remind you on the authority of God's word today? And this is important for anyone that, that holds to this teaching and that's this. God is God and you are not. So you can't be bossing God around and speaking life into this and death into that. that that's not true. Hey, words are valuable. Words are important, but you don't create reality. Reality is apart from you. You don't create truth. Truth is, no matter what you believe, truth exists. God exists. So the word of faith has been corrupted. You know, people have ripped them off. Ripped, you, you might have been ripped off by these guys. But don't just blame them. People ripped off by the word of faith movement, they have a responsibility too. Because, you know, there's a little bit of greed in all of us. And he's like, oh, you know, if I can plant a seed faith in you and I get a hundredfold, I'm in. No, you got to be careful who you give your ear to. And you want to be repentant. It's not just their fault. Now, false teachers are going to answer for that, but you too will answer for it. You know, because that's part of, their, it's part of their gimmick. You know, they'll be on television and say, oh, here, you know, sow $100, and you, $100 to my ministry, plant a seed here, and you'll get a hundredfold increase. Did I already say what I think about that? Nonsense. $200, $300. I just think, oh, wait a minute, I'm hearing from the Lord. Isaiah 55, 56. So if you give me $55.5, nonsense. You want to test me on it? Test me on it. Call it for one brief moment, watch one of those shows and get the 800 number, then turn it off. Call the 800 number. Bing, bing. Hello, rip off ministry. How can I help you? Well, I was just watching so-and-so on the TV, and he said, if I give you $100, if I sow my seed of $100 in your ministry, I'll get a hundredfold increase. Other phone, yes, yes, that's true. Oh, okay, what's your credit card number? Oh, wait a minute, I got a couple more questions. Well, if $100 works, does $200 work? Oh, you'll get so much more. How about $1,000? Oh, $1,000 will get you a million-fold increase and a free Bible. Yes, what's your credit card number? No, 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 actually... If you really believe that, I do believe it, sir. Yes, what's your credit? If you really believe that, I'm going to put my credit card away and I'm going to ask you, okay, what would you ask me? Would you get your credit card out? And I would like you to give me $1,000 so that you'll get the hundredfold increase. And you know what's going to happen? Click. Because even the people answering the phone know it's a hoax. Even they know. Because you could see the dishonesty that surrounds this false teaching. Don't do it. And if you have been ripped off by them before, I'm sorry, but don't let it happen again. You gave as unto the Lord. Maybe it touched a little bit of your greed, but you were still giving as unto the Lord. So just move on from that, mature from that, and don't fall prey to any of that. And they also, you know, they like to take advantage of people that are vulnerable. And so be careful when you're vulnerable. Be careful who you present yourself to. And it may not even be on TV anymore. You know, YouTube and different places where you're just looking, 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 looking. Listen, before you go any of those places, look to the Lord. He's ready to encourage you and comfort you. He's ready to strengthen you. He's ready. Depend and walk and follow the Holy Spirit. That's where Peter is here. Look, faith is involved in healing. There's no doubt. Peter saw that at the gate beautiful. He, you watch it here happening. That was earlier in Acts, remember? That this is happening now. Uh, 
The faith of Peter is being used. Later on in Acts 14, the man that was being healed, his faith is being used. In James, when, when the Bible says in James that if you're anyone sick among you, let them come to the elders and the prayer of faith. So sometimes it's the elders that are praying for you that have faith. Of course, faith is important. Faith is foundational. The Bible says that you and I, without faith, what? It is impossible to please God. So of course, faith, of course the enemy would want to mess that up. But I believe being walking in the Spirit, speaking forth his word by faith. Yes, yes, yes. But not the stuff of, speak to your wallet so it'll grow. Nope. Speak to your bald head so you can grow. No, no. God doesn't grow hair back like that. Like, no. Stop it. Speak to the Lord about your cares, the Bible says. Cast your cares upon him. Why? You have an empty wallet? Ask God for his provision. You have health challenges, ask God for his healing. You have issues with your kids and prodigals, take them to the throne room of grace and get help in your time of need. Be careful with those guys out there that might want to use this against you, which brings me to number five that kind of goes together. And that is not only are we depending upon the Holy Spirit, but you're also walking in the Spirit. You're walking by faith. So those two go together, walking by faith. Which brings me to the next one, number six. Pay attention to the one. Pay attention to the one, and I mean the individual. I'm really encouraged by Peter here because he is, if not, he's one of, if not the key leader of the church. He is the key leader. If anyone would be considered, and I don't like this phrase, but I'm going to use it because you understand it, the big dog, Peter is it. But where do we find him? In some obscure house with one guy that he didn't even know. He's not these massive evangelistic crusades as much as wonderful as they are. And he could do those. That's no problem. We see that earlier on. But where is he right now? He is in a house with a guy that's been suffering for eight years, ministering to him. You want to be used greatly? Never forget the one. Don't look over the one that's in front of you. She or he is the one that God has for you. Even if you have a position of great authority, even if you are doing great, even if, don't forget the one. You know, I, I go to a lot of pastor's conferences. I teach at a lot of conferences. I attend a lot of conferences. And that, this happens all the time. And I, so I teach the guys here. I teach anyone. Like, don't do this. But you'll be talking to someone at a pastor's conference, and they're looking over your shoulder. You know why? Because there's a big dog behind you. And so while they're talking to the puppy, they actually want to talk to the big dog that's back there. And I've even had times where it's not even like, excuse me, they were talking to me and then I look up and they're gone. And I turn around, I'm like, oh, all right. No, the person in front of you, you know, it doesn't have to be pastor's conference. It could be anything. You got to pay attention to the person in front of you. The person that has been bedridden for eight years, the person that's been paralyzed, that person has a story, he has a life. He has your attention. There's nobody more important than the person in front of you. No one. God has brought them there and Peter served him well. Now notice with me in verse 36 now. It says, As Jop at Joppa, there was a certain disciple named Tabitha, which is translated Dorcas, this woman was full of good works and charitable deeds. Let's just pause there for a second and understand number seven. You ready? Number seven. Pay attention. You want to serve well. Pay attention to how you want to be remembered. Pay attention to how you want to be remembered. You go, Ed, what do you mean? Well, notice Dorcas here. Now, first of all, we might remember her because of her name translated in English. Not the kind of name you want to give your daughters, right? Don't name your daughter Dorcas. It's not going to work in the English. In the Greek, it's actually a beautiful word. It means gazelle, but it doesn't translate well. But now you can think, okay, that's an interesting name, but that's not what she's remembered for. What is she remembered for? This woman was full of good works and charitable deeds, which she did. She was full of good works. That's what she's remembered for. And if you want to serve well, listen, you've got to pay attention to how you want to be remembered. You are by who you are today by the accumulation of all the decisions prior, but it doesn't have to stay that way. You know, some people are known as gossips. Well, you can change that. 
Some people are known as busybodies. You can change that. Some people are known for their charitable deeds. Some people are known for their good works. Some people are known for their character and integrity. But if you don't pay attention to it, you don't, you don't focus on what kind of man or what kind of woman God wants you to be, you're not going to be very effective in the kingdom. You've got to pay attention to how you want to be remembered. Because you will be remembered, friend. Our church will be remembered. The ministry here, it will be remembered. The question is how? Notice it says in verse 37, it happened in those days that she became sick and died. And when they washed her, they laid her in an upper room. And since Lydda was near Joppa, the disciples had heard that Peter was there. They sent two men to him, imploring him not to delay in coming to them. Then Peter arose, went with them, When he had come, they brought him into the upper room, and all the widows stood by him, weeping, showing the tunics and garments which Dorcas had made while she was with him. Now, let me pause again here, because this is amazing to me. Dorcas' ministry was to the widows. What was the first big problem in the early church? There was a division between the widows over the distribution of the practical things. And we know that God raised up a leadership of men to help serve that. But I want you to always remember, there are things going on behind the scenes that you don't know. And so the ministry to the widows was not exclusively these men, because here we have an example later on of Dorcas having a heart for widows. So men and women were being used greatly by God. I love this. This is so good. Look, notice, Peter put them all out. The widows that she blessed, they're all weeping and crying. Peter put them out. He knelt down and he prayed. And then he turned the body to the body and said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened up her eyes. When she saw Peter, she sat up and gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, he presented her alive. Again, I just, this is astonishing stuff. It's in the Bible. God He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And he can do amazing things. And this is astonishing to me. And notice, it became known throughout all of Joppa that many believed on the Lord. And it was there that he stayed many days in Joppa with Simon the Tanner, which we'll get to in a second. A few more points before we head out, but this is just amazing stuff. Let me give you number eight. You ready? Number eight, you want to serve well? Go where you're invited. Or go where you're wanted. Or go where you're needed. Like, go where you're, go. I guess that's the key word. They found out, like, nothing just so happens by chance with God. Nothing just so happens. These are divine appointments. How would Peter ever know, being in this room by himself with this eight-year paralyzed person, bedridden person, that God was actually going to set it up to now raise a woman from the dead? Like that, that God had that already in mind because he has his plan and purposes working out for us. So the people he brings into our lives, the people we meet, the situations, they're all from the Lord. We don't know how he's going to use them yet, but they're all from the Lord. And this invitation, they heard. We, we, we got to be careful. Don't think of this in 21st century. This is no phone, no Twitter, no social media. Like word had to get from Lydda to Joppa. It had to go from Joppa to Lydda, I should say. It had to get out. Hey, Peter's there, Peter's there, Peter. Well, then tell him to come. So word came back, and they send back. We need him here. And then he comes back. I mean, this is some time that takes place here. Nothing just so happens, church. And so go where you're invited, which leads me to number nine. We only have two more, and then we'll head out. Number nine, I want you to know something about Dorcas, and that's, that is, I want, I want to encourage you, do what you do for the glory of God, not just for money. Do what you do for the glory of God, not just for money. You add, what do you mean by that? Dorcas, she obviously had a practical skill. She could sew and put things together. Maybe like today we'd say knitting and sewing. And, and he, she, she had a practical skill. And she used that practical skill to bless the church. She didn't charge for it. She didn't make it. Like she did what she did for the church, for the glory of God, to bless these widows, to encourage them. And church, I want to tell you, this room is filled with expertise and talent and high-level education and experience that are all grace gifts from God. 
And I'm here to remind you, please use those things for the glory of God, not just money. It doesn't always have to be for money. The Lord can use it in your life so you can build a bridge to help serve others. I think of the practical needs that are in, our, in, in life, but also in our church. You know, some of you are excellent cooks. Well, cook, not just for money. Some of you are wonderful mechanics. Some of you are good at construction or financial planning or investing or like so many gifts and talents in the church. Don't let the world rip you off that it's only for money. Look at God will supply all of your needs according to his riches in Christ Jesus. And of course, you're going to use it to provide for your family, and this is your career, and this is what... Of course, of course, yes, God's placed us all in different areas of the life. I was in the corporate world for many years. Yes, yes, yes. But what I have found is the world, it just makes us so paranoid and so fearful about the future, and what's this going to be, so that now we associate everything we do with some side hustle, And you know, you can use your gifts and talents without a side hustle. You can do it for the glory of God. And you can bless people in Jesus' name. And maybe it's one of those things where you don't even have a lot of money, but you are so gifted. Like if you can make pies, then you just make pies to the glory of God. Not rhubarb, that's not fair. (laughs) But but like you can make pies to the glory of God and just bless somebody. And you know, you can just minister to to someone that's grieving. You minister to a new mom that just had a baby. What like... There is so much for the church to do. It doesn't always have to be for a buck. Are you with me? All right, number number 10. Number 10. Our final thing today, and that is this. Be open and flexible. Be open and flexible. God may do something you don't know anything about. God may do something that you didn't ever plan. And that's where we get to verse 43. Because notice Peter stayed in Joppa with Simon, a tanner. You know what a tanner works with? dead animal carcasses. You know what a Leviticus chapter, this is why you read Leviticus in your Bible study, by the way. You know what a Leviticus chapter 11 verses 35 through 40 say? It's unclean to be with people that touch dead animal carcasses and to touch them yourselves. So Peter, we know, he is a very, what we would call today a very conservative Jew following as close as he can. Like he is committed But this little step here, he's staying. We don't know all the details how he ends up here. We just know he ends up there will be the beginning of something God's going to do because you got to read ahead in chapter 10. We'll get there next time. Chapter 10 brings us to Caesarea Philippi. I was just in Caesarea Philippi a couple weeks ago. Opened the Bible to this very place. And I said, you won't believe where you're standing right now. You are here where the gospel exploded to the Gentiles through a man by the name of Cornelius. Cornelius lives in Caesarea. And here now, Peter's in Joppa with a tanner. But what, why, the, why is the tanner so significant? Read ahead. And you'll see God's going to begin to deal. Well, no, let me just give you the summary. Let me give you the summary. This is what God's going to end up telling Peter. This is so good. This is so good. He's going to tell Peter. He's going to say, listen, Peter, what I call clean, don't you call unclean. And he was talking about people. He was bursting through Peter's heart to go, look, bro, you're already seeing some people that are very, they're different than you. They're outside and and you've got the wrong view about them. They are not unclean. They're clean because I've made them clean. I've sent my son Jesus to die for them. I love them. And you see, God is doing things with his plans, purposes, his power, his provision, that we don't yet know we're walking in them. We're walking in them. And the book of Acts is not some, some story in the Bible that don't, doesn't get lived out. This is God's will for us to go forth by faith, to, do, to look for things and do them, to do things we don't want to do. Let me just repeat them for you before we head out. Pastor Ian and the team can come back up. Let me just repeat them for you. Number one, give out as much as you can take in. Number two, look for things to do and do them. Number three, do things you don't want to do. Number four, depend on and follow the Holy Spirit. Number five, walk by faith. Number six, pay attention to the one. Number seven, pay attention to how you want to be remembered. To me, that's a golden nugget right there. You can change the whole direction of your life as a believer. Number eight, 
Go where you're invited. Number nine, do what you do for his glory. And then finally, be open and flexible. Look, this is a word from the Lord because, you know, I have my notes on my iPad, right? They're already done. They're done by Friday or Thursday. But after last night, I had to, I, I put it all together and I, I just trying to work it out. I'll probably even clean it up later. Maybe take this as a traveling message to encourage people. But I want you to know, even what you have planned, God can change it along the way. He, he can move it along. He can adjust it. He, he, can, he can do whatever he wants with your life. But if you keep resisting him, you keep grieving him, you keep fighting him, you keep holding on to bitterness and unforgiveness like they're your best friends, you're not going to experience the fullness of Christ. And some of you, today is the day where you, you must turn from your sins. Today is a day of salvation. And it could very well be that God is drawing you to himself today that you would come to him and repent of your sins and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So Father, we pray as we head out today that so much, so much going on, so much happening in our hearts, so much to take in, God, that we might just think them through. A couple nuggets in my life, God, to remind me of your goodness and grace. That you would pour out your spirit in a fresh way in our lives today. And if you're here today, you've never given your life to Jesus, I'm going to invite you to do that. It's a high and holy moment right now. You would say, Ed, I want to follow Jesus. Would you just stand to your feet? I want to pray with you that today would be the day God wants to do a work in your life. God bless you over here. Who else would say, that's me? That today would be the day. God bless you in the back. And somebody's going to come alongside of you when you guys stand. Don't be a, it's somebody that's doing it on purpose. They want you to know you're not alone. God bless you in the back and over here on the side. You guys go ahead and move. Avant, you can come over here. Josh is right there. Who else would say, that's me? Of course, you guys out online, I don't see you or on the radio, but the good news is it doesn't matter what I see. God sees you. Even downstairs in the overflow, listening out in your car in the parking lot, God knows. We all came the same way. Repentance. Acknowledging the goodness of God. The Bible says, if we confess with our mouths the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart, God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So I want to help you with that. Talking directly to God. Because a church doesn't save you. Ed doesn't save you. Even a prayer doesn't save you. Only God, through his son Jesus Christ, the blood that was shed for you, saves you. So you can talk to God like this. You can say, God, I admit that I've sinned against you and I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins. And I believe you sent Jesus to live for me, to die for me. And I believe he rose again from the dead to save my soul. And I turn away from my sins today to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Church. For prayer, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. To listen to this message in its entirety or to join us for our live stream services, visit us online at calvaryco.church or download our free Calvary Church app. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.